Southern Fraud True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. The phrase, it's always the husband, is a popular trope in true crime. I've got an episode named that, the case of Michael Morton, who is actually an innocent man. You see it in memes, hear it on podcasts, and on shows like Dateline and even fictional shows like Dexter. It's a trope for a reason. Studies are all over the place on percentages, but for women, only about 10% are killed by strangers. Of the women killed by someone they know, anywhere from 60 to 75% are killed by their husband, boyfriend, or partner. And murder is the number one cause of death for pregnant women. It is when a woman is most vulnerable. It's sickening to think of pregnancy as a motive, but we've seen it too many times to ignore it. I've covered at least three of these murders before. In today's episode, Belinda Temple was about three weeks away from giving birth when she was murdered. The respected and beloved teacher from Katy, Texas, was married to the popular football coach at another school, David Temple. They seemed like a wholesome power couple, people you can look up to. But there are always secrets the dark underbelly that is the intimacy of marriage. David had the age-old motive of an affair with another woman, a love triangle. He was obviously the first suspect, but he wasn't the only one. He was just the one the Harris County prosecutor decided to focus on. This is a complicated case. The attorneys involved are famous, legendary even, and the legal wranglings in this case are too much to cover in one episode. So this is part one of the Belinda Temple murder case, The Husband, David Temple. Episode 127 I want to apologize here at the beginning for making this episode a two-parter. To be honest, I hate two-parters, and I know some listeners do too. But trying to cram all the insane detail of this case into one episode was stressing me out, and it was not doing justice to this case. It's one of the most infamous publicized cases in recent Texas history, or at least in Harris County history, notorious in its own right. The famous attorneys involved for the prosecution and defense have to be given a closer look, especially the prosecutor, Kelly Siegler, who went on to have her own TV show, Cold Justice. A few journalists feel she used the Temple case to propel her to TV stardom. Brady violations, Texas discovery laws, and even the Michael Morton Act are important in this case. I covered Michael Morton in episode 110, ironically titled, It's Always the Husband. And to the pearl clutcher in an iTunes review who yelled at me for that, look up the definition of irony, or what tongue-in-cheek means. The whole episode was about an innocent man, railroaded by a prosecutor for God's sake. Anyway, I could have used that title again for the Belinda Temple case. Because whether it's true or not, it was certainly the driving force for the investigation. Having said all this, y'all know that I will never lose sight of the victims in this case, and I think that's part of the problem with the publicity. Belinda and her unborn baby girl are often steamrolled by the sensationalism. I'll do my very best to honor her and her family. And now on to the story. Katy, Texas is a small city, a suburb about 30 miles west of downtown Houston. A lot of residents who live in the friendly community commute to Houston for work. Katy is part of the greater Houston metropolitan area, and you can actually have a greater Katy postal address without living there. It sits at a tri-point of Harris, Fort Bend, and Waller counties. Old Town Katy was a railroad town first founded in the 1890s. It was originally called Cane Island for the creek that ran through the area. The creek was filled with tall cane, perennial grasses with woody stalks, thought to have been planted by the Carancoa indigenous tribes or Spanish explorers in the 1820s. In 1845, James J. Crawford received a land grant for the area, but by 1875, only his family, two other white families, and the families of two former enslaved men called Cane Island home. The climate and hard clay soil made it hard to attract settlers to the area. But with hard work, corn, peanuts, and cotton became the first successful crops before Katy became known for its rice fields. On September 8, 1900, 
The Great Galveston Hurricane of 1900 swept away almost the entire town. Only two of the original Katy homes survived. That Kane Island rebuilt and became incorporated as the city of Katy in 1945. Today it's known for its railroad, rice farms, and for being the waterfowl hunting capital of the world. And it's also known for its excellent school system, which is a big reason why Houston commuters choose to live in Katy. It was an unseasonably warm winter morning in Katy on January 11th of 1999 when Belinda Temple got a call from her son's daycare. Three-year-old Evan wasn't feeling well and was running a mild fever. 30-year-old Belinda was a special education teacher at Katy High School. She was eight months pregnant, about three weeks from her due date but she was still working full-time. She was happily expecting a baby girl. Her name would be Erin Ashley Temple. Evan and Erin, I love that. I'm sure she did too. Belinda had a busy day ahead of her, including an afternoon meeting that she couldn't reschedule. She told the daycare that she would call her husband, David, to pick Evan up. But David didn't pick up his phone. Belinda told one of her friends, I don't know where he's at. He should be at work. I can't get a hold of him. The friend later recalled that it was the most frustrated she had ever seen the usually unflappable Belinda. Belinda rushed out and went to get Evan, taking him to their home in the Cimarron subdivision in Katy, and she kept calling David. She finally got him on the phone at 1230 and explained that she had to get back to work, so he had to come stay with Evan. Her colleagues said she made it back to work by 1 p.m. She made her afternoon meeting and then left school for the day around 3.30 p.m. At 3.32 p.m., she called David at home. The call lasted 30 seconds. Belinda was on her way to David's parents' house to pick up some homemade soup for Evan before she would head home. She left her in-laws at around 3.55 p.m. and was home not long after 4 p.m. David and Belinda lived just minutes from his parents' house. David later said Belinda was worn out. She was tired and her feet were swollen. He said he told her to go upstairs and lie down, and he would take Evan out to run errands with him while Belinda rested. The little boy was evidently feeling better. Since it was a nice day and still light out, David said they would go to the park first. He said they stopped at one park and then decided to go to a bigger park, but on their way there, Evan said he was thirsty, so they stopped to get drinks from a local grocer. Brookshire Brothers. Then they headed to Home Depot. David needed to get some brackets for shelving in the new baby's room. He said they left Home Depot in time to have dinner with Belinda before she left to play bunco with her friends. At 5.35 p.m., he pulled into the garage. He told Evan he was going to let Mommy know they were home and then come back and watch him ride his bike. But when he went in the backyard, he saw the gate was open and the window in the back door was broken. Instead of going inside... David grabbed Evan from the garage and ran across the street to his neighbors, Mike and Peggy Ruggiero's house. He banged on the door several times until Mike answered. According to Peggy, David just shoved Evan at Mike and said, call 911. Mike was worried about his neighbor going back into the home alone, so he handed Evan over to Peggy and chased after David. He was shouting, wait up, but David was already inside the door of his house. Mike tried to follow, but Belinda and David's dog, Shaka, who was in the backyard, wouldn't let him pass. David ran upstairs to the master bedroom where Belinda had been lying down. It was there, inside the walk-in closet of the master bedroom, that David found his wife lying face down, crumpled up, with a gunshot wound to the back of her head. Belinda was fully clothed and still wearing her shoes and jewelry. Her glasses were broken on the floor next to her, and a cordless phone was near her hand. The last call made on that phone had been to their neighbor, Mike Ruggiero. Belinda Tracy Lucas and her fraternal twin sister, Brenda Therese, were born on December 30, 1968 in Ohio to parents Tom and Carol. The family moved down south to the city of Nacogdoches, Texas, not long after the girls were born. The Lucases had three sons, Brian, Barry, and Brent, and had just about given up on a girl when Carol became pregnant with the twins. Only they didn't know it. They thought she was about to deliver a big baby boy when Brenda came into the world, followed eight minutes later by Belinda. 
The Lucases were shocked but elated. The girls were fraternal, with Brenda having dark hair, while Belinda's was more of a dark blonde or golden brown. And they were also opposites in personality. Brenda was more shy, and Belinda was very outgoing. The youngest and the smallest of her family, Belinda was known to be scrappy and feisty. Belinda was a happy child. Friends and family describe her as bubbly, smart, and funny on into her teen years. She didn't seem to go through any awkward phases. With all those brothers, the girls were naturally tomboys. They played softball, and Belinda would go on to be a basketball star, named all-district player her senior year at Nacogdoches High School. When she graduated in 1987, Belinda was voted the girl with the most school spirit. She made friends easily, which made her not only popular, but extremely close to family friends and later her colleagues. She made real connections to the people in her life. As an adult, those qualities made her a passionate and gifted educator. As a teacher at Katy High School, she was called Sunshine Girl for her kindness and endless energy. Her husband, David Mark Temple, was born on July 19, 1968 in Texas to parents Kenneth and Maureen. Ken had grown up somewhere else, but Maureen's family had been in Katy for generations. David had an older brother named Darren and a younger one named Kevin. While all three Temple brothers were athletic, it was David who became the football star of Katy, Texas. The Temples were and still are a very tight-knit family. David was known as a charmer and jokester. But friends told author Catherine Casey that his parents quite obviously favored him and that they didn't want to hear about it when David got into trouble. One friend said he was never held accountable. David played football from a young age. He was held back a year in grade school, which gave him an even bigger advantage in size. Friends and teammates said David didn't just play for fun, even in Little League. He played to win. And they said he could be egotistical and had a dark side, even as a kid. At Katy High School, he really excelled at football, becoming somewhat of a local celebrity, playing as the team's linebacker. His nickname on the Katy Tigers team was the Temple of Doom. A Katy claim to fame and native, actress Renee Zellweger, was a cheerleader at Katy High School when David played football there. She was later voted the senior class dream date, while David was named most athletic. And his reputation at the school was that of a bully. He always got what he wanted, and he only dated pretty, athletic girls. Though it didn't make any newspapers and isn't online much now, author Catherine Casey reported in her book Shattered, that David was actually arrested while in high school. He was part of a gang of high school guys breaking into cars. Though he was 18, his father was well-respected in Katy and managed to get it knocked down to a Class A misdemeanor, a $100 fine and three days in jail. There were also whispers of steroids, and David definitely bulked up in weightlifting, though he always denied drug use. Some people said the car break-ins were to get money for drugs, though this was mostly rumors. What wasn't rumor were teachers who went on record about David to Catherine Casey. They said he was feared even by staff, and one said they got sick of Maureen Temple showing up to talk her son out of trouble all of the time. But nothing ever seemed to stick to David except rumors and an unbalanced reputation. On the one hand, he was the handsome, charming jock, a bit of a snob and one of the popular kids. On the other, a hulking, intimidating young man with a volatile temper and a mean streak. After graduating high school, David got a scholarship at Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, and he seemingly put these issues in his rearview mirror, at least in the beginning. On the SFA field at 5'11 and 233 pounds, he was a big, intimidating guy, and his college coach said he believed David was so good at football because, quote, he felt the need to be in charge. Friends did say he was as aggressive off the field as he was on, but he was still a hometown hero in Katy. And there were talks of his temper and bar fights, and he had had a very tumultuous relationship with one girl, who he evidently abruptly dropped for Belinda Lucas. This girl would tell Catherine Casey that the whole Temple family basically shunned her after they had a long relationship and she had gotten close to them all. 
I mean, ex-girlfriends aren't always going to be complimentary, but the comments about his family stood out. In 1989, David was the big man on campus. That year, he assisted the university in winning its first ever conference championship. A native in Nacogdoches, Belinda Lucas was also at SFA, where she was a great student and was very athletic herself. She taught aerobics at a place called UltraFit, and she also worked at a local grocery store to put herself through school. To hear David's ex tell it, they met at the bar where she worked on her night off. Her friends told her about David dancing with this Belinda Lucas. She confronted him, he swore nothing happened, and then basically ghosted her the next day. And from then on, he and Belinda Lucas were inseparable. David and Belinda were a good-looking couple, both brunettes, athletic, fit, and tan. They were called a golden couple, and they looked the part. Belinda had what people would call a thousand-watt smile. In Catherine Casey's book, Shattered, there is talk that Belinda's family had some issues. They were not as close as the kids got older. Carol told the author, quote, I don't know why we're not closer. The kids just don't come around. And Tom said their door was always open, but they just didn't see them much. Of course, these quotes were after the horror of losing Belinda and her unborn child. But there is talk before that. Belinda would later make a point of saying she wanted her own career and independence. She didn't want to be like her mom, dependent on her dad, who could be a bit controlling. But for whatever reason, by the time the kids were in college, the family had grown a bit distant. Maybe that's why she didn't only fall for David. The Temple family took her in like she was their own daughter. They adored her. She spent more and more time visiting Katie with David than seeing her own parents in town. But she would probably later realize she ran with open arms into exactly what she had tried to run away from, a controlling man. In David's earlier serious relationship, he was domineering. And, according to his ex, emotionally abusive, if not somewhat physically abusive. With Belinda, at least initially, he treated her very well and even seemed to grow up some. He took care with his money. They seemed on equal footing as a couple. But there were some early problems beneath the veneer. Brenda, her twin, noticed it right away. Her sister seemed to lose her normal self-confidence around David. And soon, people heard David call the Lucas family rednecks and white trash. While they were dating, they rented a house together and then got a chow mix dog who they named Shaka. Neighbors came to fear the dog. She was known to be vicious and aggressive, and she was extremely protective of her owners. After dating for around a year, the young couple got engaged. David proposed on their college football field on the 50-yard line. It was extremely romantic, and Belinda was elated. Her family had misgivings, but held their tongues. Belinda was so happy. Maybe it would work. Their romance had been quick and storybook-like. Belinda's friends said David was very affectionate, and that the couple, quote, did everything the fairy tale way. I think this plays into that golden couple myth you see about the couple everywhere. They were married on January 4, 1992. After graduating from college, the newlyweds got their first jobs. Belinda worked as a teacher and David as a coach. While working, they continued going to school, both earning master's degrees in education. Three years into their marriage in 1995, Belinda and David welcomed their first child, a son named Evan. The couple were known to be devoted parents and seemingly happily married. Following the arrival of their son, Belinda and David moved to David's hometown of Katy, Texas, just minutes from his parents' home. Belinda had gotten a new job in Katy. She was a special education teacher at Katy High School, and David was a teacher and football coach at Alif Hastings High School in Houston. David and Belinda also joined his family's Baptist church, though they didn't really attend regularly. They made quick friends with their neighbors and were well-known and liked in the community, for the most part. As a coach, David was described as the guy you wouldn't want to piss off. He seemed to forget he was coaching high school kids. He had to be reined in a lot by his fellow coaches. And Belinda, of course, was known as Sunshine Girl, the teacher everyone loved, 
the colleague everyone counted on. They rented a house for a while, saving up money, and then David kept pushing to buy a house. And when they did, it was in a much more upscale neighborhood, though still a five-minute drive from his parents' home. The new house was a two-story red brick colonial on a corner lot in the Cimarron subdivision, which is south of I-10. It does look expensive in photos. And the house was probably above their means as teachers. They didn't have enough for the down payment, as Brenda, Belinda's twin sister, later revealed, so she loaned them the money. But Belinda did love her new home and happily decorated Evan's room in bright colors. And she again was really friendly with her neighbors, while David was seen as more standoffish. In the summer of 1998, Belinda found out she was pregnant with a baby girl. She was due in early 1999 and had already picked a name out, Erin Ashley. She was ecstatic to have another baby, and she set up the nursery and painted it yellow all by herself. A point friends later made often. She did everything by herself, taking care of their home while David just gave her orders. Early in their relationship, they were seen working in the yard together, going grocery shopping together, all the things close couples seem to do. But after a few years of marriage, David seemed to be running the show, leaving all the work to his wife. And Belinda struggled with being a coach's wife. She was alone a lot with a new baby, who soon became a rambunctious toddler. But she didn't complain much. She put on a happy face. She made friends with other coaches' wives, enjoyed her career and motherhood. After the discovery of Belinda's body, David called 911 at 5.38 p.m. The dispatcher asked if Belinda had a pulse, and David said, No, she's dead. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus Christ. Then the dispatcher told David to give Belinda CPR. She later said, Come on, we've got to do it for that baby. And David replied, I can't. Her head is just gone. Outside of the temple home, Neighbor Mike was holding the back gate so Shaka couldn't escape. As police arrived, they were scared to go through the backyard because of the dog, who was aggressively barking and jumping up against the fence. Police considered shooting the dog in order to enter the house, but at that point, David came outside and calmly told police Belinda had been shot and that she was dead. He said that he found Belinda all balled up in the master bedroom closet, but he pulled her legs out and she was lying on her stomach. Much was made of this later, as if he moved the body intentionally. But if he was checking to see if she was alive, he would have had to pull her out. 2020 aired partial crime scene photos, and the top of Belinda's body was underneath a clothing rack. According to court documents, the hanging clothes near Belinda's body had been pushed to the side at some point after she was shot. Those clothes had a significant amount of blood and brain matter, and they appeared to have shielded the back wall of the closet. Most of the blood and matter was on the lower rack where she had knelt down, possibly putting her head under the rack. If he didn't kill his wife, when he pulled her legs out, he would have seen that there was no hope, just as he told the 911 operator. After hanging up with 911, he walked back downstairs to meet the police. In order for the police to enter the home, David put Shaka in the garage and then waited outside. During this time, Police later described him as quiet and very calm. He wasn't crying. But when he found out he needed to give police a statement, he did become agitated. Police also noted that David had no blood on his person at all, some saying that meant that he never attempted to perform CPR to save Belinda's life. I think that was clear from the 911 call, and he did say he only pulled her legs out. It's ironic because they also suspected he pulled her legs out to cover for any blood on his hands or clothes. I think the police were all over the place on David, and his calm demeanor could have been shock. Everyone handles finding a horrific scene like that differently. The autopsy later concluded that Belinda died from a 12-gauge shotgun shot to the back of her head. The shell used was a reloaded, double-aught buckshot used for deer hunting. The unborn baby girl inside of her, named Erin Ashley, weighed six pounds and was 18 inches long. Police were unable to locate the murder weapon or the spent shotgun shell in the house. However, 
there in the closet where Belinda was found, they did locate two rifles, a .30-06 and a .22. During the autopsy, the medical examiner was unable to pinpoint a time of death. Police knew that Belinda had been at David's parents' house until around 3.55 p.m., and that David called 911 at 5.38 p.m., so that did narrow down the time frame. There was gunpowder residue within Belinda's wound, so it is believed the end of the gun was touching Belinda's head when it was fired, and that Belinda was kneeling when she was shot. That leaves a chilling picture in your head. A cordless phone was found near her body. Had she run in there to hide, only to be found and executed? Or had she been marched to this closet, because it would have been the quietest place in the house if you were trying to hide the sound of a gunshot? The phone could have also been placed near her body to make it look as though she ran upstairs trying to escape her killer. The medical examiner said the shooter would definitely have had blood and tissue on them, along with blowback on and in the barrel of the gun, and the amount depended on multiple factors. Blowback was found on clothes in the closet. Not just blowback, but massive amounts of blood and brain matter. It was an absolutely grisly scene. And while there could have been blowback on the shooter, it wasn't for sure. The killer may have stuck her head into the clothes for this reason. And if there was blowback on the killer, there weren't bloody footprints coming out of the closet or anywhere else in the house. And while Belinda did die in fear, her death was mercifully instant, according to the medical examiner. And once her blood flow stopped, her unborn baby died almost immediately after her mother. When David's parents found out that Belinda had been killed, they called a defense attorney to come to the Temple House and meet with David. David's parents later said they knew that the husband is always the first suspect, so they found him an attorney as quickly as possible. That may also seem suspicious to some people, but let's be honest, they weren't wrong. They were being smart. And their instinct was right. David was taken in for questioning the night Belinda was found. He didn't have any scratches or cuts on him, and he was initially described as being cooperative. David explained to police that he was taking care of their son Evan after he had come home sick from daycare. He said he gave Evan a bath before Belinda got home, which was sometime before four o'clock. He told them that when she got home, Belinda was tired and he told her to go lie down upstairs. He said he took Evan to go to a park, but on their way, they stopped at Brookshire Brothers grocery store to grab a drink. Brookshire Brothers is around six miles north of the Temple home, a drive that would take around 12 minutes, and police confirmed that David and Evan were there on January 11th because they were captured on video entering the store at 4.32 p.m. and leaving six minutes later after buying drinks and cat food. When asked, David acknowledged that there were other grocery stores closer to his home. He went on to explain how after leaving the store, he decided not to go to the park and instead thought they would go home and have dinner with Belinda before she went to her Bunko game. For any of you who have never heard of it, Bunko is a dice game, popular in many places, but especially with Southern ladies. It's a chance to get out of the house and the regular routine of cooking dinner and getting the kids ready for bed. I imagine it was a bit of a relief valve for Belinda Temple. There were varying reports on the state of their marriage initially, but everyone agreed that Belinda had the brunt of home chores because of her life as a coach's wife. But back to the timeline of that day. Before David and Evan went home, they stopped at Home Depot to look for shelving brackets for the baby's room, because according to David, he and Belinda had been there two days earlier, but had bought the wrong size. Only once at the store, he realized he didn't have the wrong brackets with him to return. They were in Belinda's car, so he and Evan left and headed home. They were seen on camera entering Home Depot at 5.14 p.m., but their exit wasn't caught on the video. The trip from Brookshire Grocery Store to Home Depot would have taken 10 to 20 minutes, but it took David 36 minutes, which he told police was due to traffic, which is believable. When I read about Katie, a realtor site warned me about the traffic if I moved to the area. It is a suburb of Houston, with a lot of commuters on the road that time of day. David told investigators he and Evan got home shortly after 5.30 p.m. 
He said he unbuckled Evan from his car seat and helped him out of the truck, but he said he told Evan to wait in the garage while he ran inside to tell Belinda they were home. He said he'd be right back out to help Evan ride his bike. When David approached the back door, he saw that it was partially open and the window was smashed. He immediately thought the house had been broken into, so he took Evan and ran across the street to his neighbor's house. At the Temple House, police found that the back door had a window. The pane closest to the doorknob had been smashed, probably with a small tool. There were no pry marks on the door and no damage to the interior side of the door. Police began to think that Belinda had been murdered during a burglary gone wrong. But soon, the scene just seemed off to the officers. Drawers were opened, but not rummaged through. There was a tray of jewelry, with David's wedding ring, his college championship ring, a gold necklace, and his watch, which were all sitting out. Belinda's jewelry box wasn't touched either. The jewelry on Belinda's body was also still there a watch, a bracelet, a necklace, and rings on both hands. Belinda's purse was found in a downstairs closet, and nothing was missing from it. During their interview with David, he told police that nothing was stolen. However, two days later, David told his insurance company that ten pieces of women's jewelry were stolen, including three pairs of earrings, two necklaces, and two watches. David said all the jewelry had once belonged to his mother. But David didn't tell the detectives about the missing jewelry. They learned about it on the news. After police found out about the stolen jewelry, they sent a list to local pawn shops, but no items were recovered. Police had also found Belinda's keys on the stairs. Friends and family told police that Belinda usually put her purse on the kitchen counter and kept her keys next to her purse in a tray. I would think her husband might be more sure of where she kept her purse, but who knows. David said she would put her purse in the closet under the stairs and would drop her keys about a third of the way up the stairs. Well, the purse was in the right spot, but who drops their keys on the stairs? That is strange. Also, the glass from the back door was to the left of the door, and there weren't any glass shards on the couch, which was right by the door. Police thought this could mean that the door was open when the glass was broken. Others have theorized that when David came barreling through the door in a panic, he scattered the glass. In the living room, the TV was still plugged in and on its side on the floor. There were scrape marks, like the TV had just been moved across the stand and then put on the floor. Police didn't think this was something a burglar would do. I mean, maybe the TV was just too heavy and they left it. But jewelry is not heavy. And there was also just the sheer fact that the Temples lived on a corner lot in a nice neighborhood. Why would someone try to rob a house like that at such a busy time of day? After 4 p.m. is when people are getting home from work and school. The kids are already off the bus or close to it. Wouldn't a burglar have been seen by a neighbor? It's not a typical time for a robbery. After their initial interview with David and their growing suspicion that there wasn't a real break-in at the Temple home, police had follow-up questions to see if they could find more holes in his story. David became irritated and aggressive when asked to answer more questions, and according to police, he wouldn't look detectives in the eye and would shake and bounce in his chair. And though he was visibly irritated, David never shed a tear during the questioning and was hesitant in many of his answers. Detectives wanted to know for certain which park David took Evan to, because he had originally claimed it was Peckham Park, but within seconds changed his answer to Cimarron Park. When asked again, David said that after they left the house, he and Evan drove a few minutes away to the neighborhood park, Cimarron, which was closer to their home. But according to David, shortly after they arrived, they decided to go to a larger park instead. Peckham Park where they were headed to next, was several more miles away. It was on their way to Peckham that Evan said he wanted a drink, so they made a detour to the grocery store. Police later went to Cimarron Park with photographs of David and his truck, but no one recognized them. The other burning question investigators still had was, just how did a burglar get into the backyard with the temple's ferocious dog, Shaka, standing guard? Shaka was known to be fiercely protective of the Temple family and home, and was basically trained to attack strangers trying to enter their space. 
she was almost always chained up and feared by neighbors. Families avoided even walking close to the fence around the temple yard. The police had almost had to shoot her to gain entrance to the house when they first arrived on scene. She was barking, growling, and hurling herself at the fence before David locked her in the garage. But David didn't have an answer for the police. He would later say that the dog had been in the garage. Their gate had been broken, and police did find Shaka's bed and food bowls in there. But on the day of the murder, she was in the backyard when Mike Ruggiero, their neighbor, had chased David back to his house and also when the police arrived. But in theory, Shaka could have run out of the garage after her master into the yard when he ran to the back door after seeing the broken window pane. At the end of their questioning, detectives told David that he could not be eliminated as a suspect. Although there were obvious inconsistencies with his story, David wasn't arrested at the time. There wasn't enough evidence. This would not be a slam dunk case. That night, David and Evan went to sleep at his parents' house. They never returned to the home where Belinda was murdered. They lived with David's parents for almost two years. The Temple family held a visitation for Belinda in their home. And then Belinda and Aaron were laid to rest in the Katie Magnolia Cemetery with a rose granite headstone that read, We Feel the Touch of Angel Wings. At the top is the name Temple. Below reads Brenda Tracy with her birth and death dates, and then Aaron Ashley with just one date, January 11th, 1999. When police processed David's vehicle, they found that David did not have a car seat in his truck, which was odd, considering that he had taken Evan on those errands the day of his wife's murder. When asked about it, David said he always put Evan in a car seat and had no idea what happened to it. This made police think that David was in a hurry to drive away from his house and didn't remember to install the car seat. Court transcripts said this was from police photos. It's possible that Ken and Maureen Temple grabbed the car seat to take Evan with them when David went to the station for questioning. Police also tested David's shoes for blood and glass, but the results were negative. Belinda and David's clothes from the day of the murder were sent to the FBI crime lab for more testing. Following the death of his mother, Evan was interviewed by child psychiatrists. The psychiatrist found no evidence that Evan had witnessed anything traumatic that day. Police spoke with neighbors to see if they saw or heard anything that stood out on that Monday afternoon. One neighbor told police she saw David get home at around 5.25 p.m. and Evan was in the truck with him. Michael and Peggy Ruggiero told police that they saw an older model beige four-door sedan speeding through the neighborhood at around 4.35 p.m. They noticed a couple of young men inside the car wearing baseball caps. Another set of neighbors said that around 4.30 p.m., their dog started running around the fence and barking. When they looked outside, they noticed their shed door was open, which was unusual. On January 15th, four days after Belinda was murdered, the police interviewed three kids, the Roberts family, who lived in the house behind the temples. The Roberts kids said they were watching Dr. Doolittle on TV when they heard a big boom, like a gunshot. The kids were able to tell police which scene they were watching when they heard the boom, and with this information, police were able to estimate the time of the gunshot as 4.35 p.m. The Roberts kids were the only ones in the neighborhood who reported to police that they heard a boom. Many neighbors were walking in the neighborhood at the time and didn't hear anything. The Roberts kids' dad did say that this was the biggest thing that had happened in their lives. It was almost like he thought they might be making it up or had imagined it. But police now thought they had an approximate time of the gunshot. But when they looked at the video from the grocery store that David and Evan went to on the day of the murder, the timestamp was 4.32 when they entered and 4.38 when they left. The Roberts kids' story no longer fit their timeline. They would wind up being witnesses for the defense instead. But police still kept looking at the grocery and how it fit in. It was a 12-minute drive from the Temple House to the grocery store. If David left when Belinda got home at around 4 p.m., that still left 18 minutes unaccounted for, not to mention the time it took David to travel from the grocery store to Home Depot. 
A witness came forward who told police that he saw David stopped at the intersection of Morton Ranch Road and Katie Hockley cut off at around 4.50 p.m. or 5 p.m. If that was true, then David was heading from a location where his parents lived. If David's story about where he had gone that day was true, he wouldn't have been headed in that direction. This was suspicious to the police, though David denied being at the intersection. Prosecutor Kelly Siegler would later speculate that David was getting rid of the shotgun when this man had seen him. There were several hunting fields around David's parents' property. Police also interviewed Belinda's friends and family and found out that she hadn't been her usual happy self lately. Belinda's twin sister, Brenda, said that David was controlling. When she visited Belinda after Christmas in 1998, she noticed that the couple was not getting along. The twins' 30th birthday was on December 30th, their golden birthday. It was supposed to be a happy time. But the Temples were arguing about Belinda's pregnancy and how David wasn't happy about it. David kept making fun of Belinda's big butt, and Brenda told Belinda that she needed to stand up for herself. He also announced to his wife in front of Brenda that he was going on a hunting trip for New Year's. He would be gone for two days. Belinda was really hurt. It wasn't just that it was close to her birthday or the holidays, but it was three days before their anniversary and a month before she was due to give birth. All of this ugliness happened in front of Belinda's twin sister two weeks before her murder. Brenda may have never liked David Temple, but that hunting trip story was true. Well, at least as a cover story, it was. Tammy Harlan, Belinda's close friend, said that she was a strong-willed woman who would become submissive around her husband. Tammy said that David would put Belinda down in front of other people. He called her fat and ugly, and he would insult her family, who he called crazy and white trash. Tammy Harlan knew a lot about the Temple marriage. Her husband, Quentin, was a football coach with David, so Tammy and Belinda were football wives and became close friends. While plenty of family, friends, and colleagues had noticed problems, the Harlans saw actual fights and knew much more about what was going on in the Temple marriage. Even though Belinda still worked out constantly, still doing aerobics, and even jogging while pushing Evan's stroller, her weight was evidently a sore issue with David. She said all the Temple men made comments about fat women. Tammy and Quentin witnessed David calling his wife a fat ass, and they were embarrassed and hurt for Belinda. David also openly criticized how Belinda raised Evan. He would grab his son out of timeout after Belinda scolded the little boy. It's not as though she was harsh with the toddler. She adored her son, but she was being a good parent. It was almost weirdly like how David's own parents had favored him. He was David's little man, and he wasn't going to be disciplined. He also didn't want Evan around Belinda's family, whom he considered trash and naturally often made fun of their weight. Both of her parents were heavy set, and I can only imagine how hurtful this was for Belinda, and she did avoid her parents' home. But she also didn't like having to spend every weekend at David's parents' home either. Tammy Harlan often encouraged her friend to stand up for herself, but she also held things back. She knew from her husband, Quentin, that David was often out at bars and strip clubs and went home with other women. She would later say she just couldn't bring herself to tell Belinda. But Belinda was not stupid. She saw the trips to bars and clubs on their credit card bills. Tammy told author Catherine Casey that Belinda called her upset about what she had found, and Tammy still didn't tell her about David cheating. But she did mention the call to Quentin, who told David he had better start opening the bills before his wife did. This evidently caused a huge blowout. Belinda must have confronted her husband. Tammy said she called her the next day crying and said, don't ever tell Quentin anything I say about David again. After that, David stopped speaking to Belinda for six weeks. They participated in normal family functions and acted fine in public. But at home, it was icy and they slept apart. She did confide in other friends about this. Tammy wasn't the only one who knew what was going on. Tammy later said she was proud Belinda was standing her ground, but she told author Catherine Casey that the fight, or silent war as Casey called it, ended rather suddenly. Belinda asked her husband if he still loved her, 
out of the blue one night as he walked past her door where she was reading. He said, I don't know. Belinda was crushed and thought her marriage was over. But a couple of days later, as she was putting Evan to bed, David came up behind her, embraced her, and said, I love you. And just like that, it was over. She happily told friends they had reconciled. But this time, Tammy said she was through with the dramatics. She told Catherine Casey it was causing fights in her own marriage, and she distanced herself from Belinda. And then it was barely weeks later when Belinda announced her new pregnancy to friends. She was so excited. Friends and family, of course, suspected this baby was an attempt to repair their marriage. A band-aid baby, so to speak. But they were happy if it worked out. They loved Belinda, and this was what she wanted. Tammy Harlan also loosened up towards her friend with the news. She too hoped the new baby was what the couple needed, and especially hoped that David would become faithful again. After that rough summer, Belinda happily returned to school with her wonderful pregnancy news. There were still some visible cracks in the marriage, but others saw them as a great couple, affectionate and loving. It just proves that sometimes you show your best face to people. And it also shows that sometimes people see what they want to see. David was also having an exciting return to school that fall. Hastings High had decided to put ninth graders in their own annex building. David and Quentin were both moved to that building. I never have read exactly what subject either man taught, but I'm assuming like most coaches in my schools, it was health or driver's ed. No offense to any coaches who might be listening. There were also some new hires to accommodate the new building and overflow of students. One was a pretty young English teacher, blonde, trim, and what Nancy Grace would later sarcastically call the new trophy at school. All the men hit on her, including Quentin and David. Her name was Heather Scott, and she had moved there from Kansas. Quentin would later claim that the flirtation started with him, but as Tammy put it, those men were competitive about everything, and that soon included Heather. David and Heather started going to happy hours together and hanging out after work. Their flirtation soon turned into a full-blown affair. According to Heather's statements to police, she felt bad about dating a married man. On January 5, 1999, Heather told David she didn't want their relationship to continue the way it had been. On January 8, David told Heather... I have totally fallen in love with you. I guess she had needed some kind of declaration because Heather replied, I feel the same way. That was only three days before Belinda Temple's head was blown off with a 12-gauge shotgun. Quentin Harlan said that on January 13, 1999, the night David's parents held a visitation for Belinda at their home, Quentin and Tammy went to the visitation. As soon as he and David were alone, David asked Quentin how Heather was doing. He also said he was sorry that Heather had to go through this, and he asked Quentin to tell Heather he was sorry. At his wife's visitation. As the months passed, investigators working Belinda's case continued to look into David, who was their main suspect, but they just had no proof other than the affair. In April, Quentin and Tammy Harlan had to testify at a grand jury hearing. Following the hearing, they received a call from David. Tammy answered, and David asked what they said at the hearing. Tammy told David they weren't allowed to talk about it and gave the phone to Quentin. David asked Quentin the same question, and Quentin simply said he told the truth. David told Quentin, you know, you need to keep your mouth shut. Not long after this phone call, according to Quentin and Tammy, David kept up his intimidation efforts. One day, while Quentin was driving, he noticed that David was following him. When they came to a stop, David got out of his truck and asked Quentin what he was telling the police. Quentin once again said he was just telling the truth. David said, keep your damn mouth shut. Tammy also claimed he followed her to work. But the grand jury failed to indict David Temple. Despite these alleged threats, his inconsistent stories, and the affair, David was not arrested. By spring, Belinda's murder investigation had officially gone cold and David and Heather Scott were now openly dating. David had sent flowers to Heather on Valentine's Day, a month after Belinda's murder, and they were seeing each other again by March, two months after the murder. 
Even David's family was angry about this, and you know they usually thought their golden boy could do no wrong. David and Heather were engaged by January of 2001, exactly two years after Belinda's murder, and they married on June 9, 2001. Nearly five years after Belinda was murdered, the FBI crime lab gunshot residue test results on Belinda and David's clothes came back. The investigators had been waiting on these results literally for years, and now they finally had their answers. There was matching gunshot residue on both Belinda and David's clothing. Finally, the police had enough to arrest David, and on November 30, 2004, they took him into custody. For the record, a lieutenant with the Harris County Sheriff's Department told the Daily Sentinel that there was no new evidence in the case, but, quote, increased work and totality of the evidence was enough to bring charges against David. You'll want to keep that in your back pocket for the next episode. The Lucases, Belinda's family, had always believed that David was her killer. And David also kept Evan from them for all those years. Can you imagine losing your daughter in such a horrific murder and then never being allowed to see your grandson again? Tom and Carol Lucas had joined the organization Parents of Murdered Children to try and get through their grief with the support group. It was also a comfort to them since they had been estranged from their grandson, something that, unfortunately, isn't unusual in these situations. When Tom spoke with a local news reporter, his thoughts were with his grandson. He said, quote, He's nine now, and I don't know where he is or what's happening to him. I'm concerned as to how he could be affected by all this. Evan Temple had lost his mother before he was even old enough to remember her. He only knew Heather Scott as his mother, and he always believed in his father's innocence. He does to this day. Southern Fried True Crime is produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by Haley Gray and written by Hannah Newcomb and myself. Part two will be out next Friday. And let me tell y'all, it will be a doozy. Texas justice at its finest. This episode was edited by Resonant Recordings. Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. As some of you already know, Facebook shut down our original discussion group. But search for the new one, Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group. We still worship our patron saint, Dolly Parton, share fun memes and delicious recipes. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it's how we run the group. Please submit case suggestions to southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept suggestions on social media. And I apologize if I am unable to answer your email. I get dozens of suggestions a week, and it takes time to go through and check out each case. I will definitely contact you if I plan to use the case you submit to see if you would like to be credited on the episode. Thank you all so much for sending in these cases. I truly get my most interesting cases from listener suggestions, so keep them coming. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.